This video was brought to you by Bespoke Post, an online shopping experience in which you can help support American small businesses. Hello friends, my name is JJ and welcome to my latest entry in my award-winning series on the American cultural canon, where we look at why some specific things are so beloved on this continent. In response to much popular demand, today we will be looking at ice cream flavors. So ice cream is of course one of the single most iconic American foodstuffs of modern times. Perhaps we could even say it is one of the big five entries in the American food canon, alongside hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, and pizza. It is so iconic, in fact, that you often see ice cream used as a generic symbol of food on those no eating in the Walmart signs. Americans did not come up with the idea of ice cream, however. In fact, no one really did. I like this line from this excellent book, Ice Cream The Whole Scoop by Gail Demereaux. Ice cream was never really invented. It more or less evolved on its own. Basically, humans have always liked eating cold things, particularly cold, sweet things. And so from the earliest of times, it occurred to all sorts of different people in all sorts of different countries and cultures to make treats out of ice and snow. Since at least the 1500s, it had become common for European aristocrats to dine on fancy desserts made of ground up ice, flavored with cream and berries and spices, including some stuff that seems pretty gross by today's standards, like ginger or rose water or pumpernickel. The fact that it is still common to this day to eat ice cream in extremely fancy dishes is a lingering legacy of its elitist background. Now, the fact that these proto ice creams were eaten exclusively by wealthy elites was significant because it reflected how rare and exclusive many of the base ingredients of ice cream were until relatively recently. Before electric ice making machines were invented, for instance, the only the only way you could get ice was by literally getting someone to hike up to a glacier or mountain and harvest it for you, like in the beginning of Frozen. Sugar was also very rare in the days before the massive sugar plantations in the New World were established, as were spices and fruits and nuts and cocoa powder and stuff like that, most of which would have had to been shipped in from exotic places on the other side of the planet. It would also be a long time before anyone would invent that ice cream making machine with the grinder thing at the top that I'm sure you've seen. which meant that in the early days you could only make ice cream by getting your servants to grind up all of the ice by hand and whip in the other ingredients until it congealed, which can take over an hour of continuous mixing. And if you don't believe me, I suggest you try making ice cream by hand. And when all that was done, the ice cream would have to be served immediately because of course freezers had not yet been invented either, so there was no way to store frozen food. So a dessert like this was not the sort of thing that a normal person could ever dream of eating. It was a luxury of a sort that is almost impossible possible to even fathom today, just because of how extraordinary the gap between access to food and labor and technology between the various social classes used to be. Anyway, the Europeans brought ice cream to their North American colonies, where it continued to be an aristocratic treat. Books will sometimes make a big deal about how George Washington or Thomas Jefferson liked to eat ice cream and an attempt to give it a bit of a populist sheen. But it's worth remembering that these men were themselves extraordinarily wealthy and privileged, so the fact that the president ate ice cream in those days would have been perceived much differently than it is today. But then everything changed in the mid 19th century, and according to this fine book, Ice Cream, A Global History by Laura B. Weiss, new world entrepreneurial spirit led to technological product development and marketing breakthroughs that transformed ice cream into a worldwide consumer dessert staple. Simply put, for American ice cream makers, the dessert offered a business opportunity even more than a culinary challenge. And I mean, the numbers don't lie. In the year 1859, only 4,000 gallons of ice cream were produced for the whole country. By 1919, it was 150 million. How did it happen? Well, as usual, we can thank that glorious age of capitalistic progress we call the Industrial Revolution. I discussed this more in my award-winning video on the history of American candy, but basically there were a bunch of new innovations in the 1800s that made the mass production of sweets vastly easier, including a mass proliferation of sugar plantations across the Americas, often run by slave labor that made sugar much more common and cheap, innovations in coal and steam power that led to the rise of factories 
able to do things like mix food ingredients at an enormous scale, and a broadly rising standard of living for most Americans that resulted in more people having more money to spend on frivolous things like sugary snacks. The growth of the American ice cream industry, in particular, was also greatly assisted by the growth of a large-scale consumer ice industry in America, wherein advancements in rail transportation made it easier to ship large quantities of ice from mountains or glaciers to urban centers. So all these developments came together to create a perfect storm, and in 1851, a guy called Jacob Fusel opened America's first industrial-scale ice cream factory in York County, Pennsylvania, and the rest is history. Or not quite. While ice cream was now easy to make at a large scale, it was still very difficult to store. While primitive refrigerators known as ice boxes that literally used a giant block of ice that you had to replace every day to keep your food cool were gradually becoming more common among middle class families in the latter half of the 19th century, they were not nearly cold enough to keep something like ice cream from melting. So for much of the Victorian age, ice cream was just something that Americans bought to order. Drug stores used to sell soda, which was once marketed as medicine. To make the soda more delicious, they would sometimes put cream in it, and then ice cream, and then just shut down the drugstore altogether and turn it into an ice cream parlor, because that was more profitable. It was also popular to buy ice cream out of people selling it from little refrigerated carts on the street corner, a tradition which of course continues on the boardwalks of America to this day. Manning an ice cream cart was a particularly popular job for Italian immigrants in late 19th century urban America, and this is a big reason why Americans tend to associate ice cream with being a more traditionally Italian food than it probably ever historically was. I mean, it is true that Italian aristocrats were fond of eating gelato, just as aristocrats elsewhere in Europe were. But if anything, this food would have been even more exotic to your average Italian, given that Italy was one of Europe's poorer countries at the time of the great Italian migration to the US. In many ways, the quote-unquote authentic Italian-style ice cream you often see sold in the US these days is a phenomenon similar to what happened with pizza or many types of pasta over the centuries which is to say that Italian Americans played a big role in reimagining a food that wasn't really all that common in Italy proper and were so successful that they wound up reverse engineering the food culture of Italy itself. The electric refrigerator was invented in 1913. And in 1929, the newly formed Frigidaire Corporation invented the electric powered home freezer. It is a testament to how popular ice cream had become by then that their original name for this new contraption was an ice cream cabinet. In the economic boom that followed the Second World War, having an electric fridge with a built-in electric freezer became an expected part of middle-class life. And this only increased ice cream sales further, with new companies like Haagen-Dazs pandering exclusively to the home ice cream market. By 1950, American ice cream consumption had ballooned to over 537 million gallons. So the difficult thing in talking about iconic American ice cream flavors, in contrast to say iconic American chip flavors or iconic American candy flavors, is that from the very beginning, one of the defining gimmicks of commercial ice cream was the staggering variety of different flavors it came in. All of the most successful American ice cream chains, like Dairy Queen and Baskin Robbins and Howard Johnson's, which was into ice cream before they got into hotels, would make a big show of how many different flavors they had, and these tended to span a pretty broad range of tastes. As a result, ice cream has evolved into a pretty unique consumer good in the sense that customers are allowed or even encouraged to have pretty idiosyncratic preferences that the industry is nevertheless happy to cater to. But in any case, according to a 2017 study by the IDFA, America's leading dairy industry lobby group, the five best-selling American ice cream flavors these days are vanilla, chocolate, cookies and cream, mint chocolate chip, and chocolate chip cookie dough. A 2020 YouGov poll by the American public, meanwhile, yielded basically the same results, with the only difference being that in their list, they also had strawberry and butter pecan. So let us now just do a quick survey of the story behind each one.
So the American love affair with chocolate is a big story in its own right, and maybe something I will someday do a whole other video on. But basically, the condensed version goes something like this. Chocolate is made from cacao beans, which are native to South America, and which the indigenous South Americans used to make a fancy drink for their elites. The Spanish conquistadors took the beans back to Europe, where they used them to make a fancy drink for their elites. They grew addicted to it and began using their colonies in Africa and the Americas to grow cacao beans in huge quantities, which, although an appalling act of imperial exploitation, also helped make chocolate powder a much cheaper and more abundant resource, just as they had done with sugar. In the mid-19th century, the Europeans began mixing cocoa powder with butter and sugar to make hard chocolate for eating, which they sold to America. Chocolate was actually a realm where America trailed Europe quite a bit, with the first major American chocolate corporation, Hershey's, not founded until 1894. But regardless of who was making it, Americans loved it, and chocolate-flavored ice cream reflects the logical convergence of two great trends in American dessert culture that were happening around the same time. Vanilla is another plant that is native to South America, and the indigenous people used it to flavor their hot chocolate. And once again, the Spanish brought it back to Europe as a treat for the aristocracy. Putting vanilla extract in your ice cream was actually one of the first uses for the plant that the Europeans dreamed up. Which only made sense because much like ice cream itself, vanilla was this very rare and expensive thing, so why not combine it with some other very rare and expensive thing? Vanilla is actually still quite rare and expensive to this day. Guess how much these two vanilla beans cost? $17. Anyway, the mass production of ice cream begat a need to find some cheaper, more abundant vanilla knockoff. In the late 19th century, and this is true, companies experimented with using an anal secretion from beavers that sort of smelled like vanilla as a replacement, but this was only marginally easier to get. Luckily, in 1874, some German scientists invented artificial vanilla extract, the first artificial flavor in the world. It was so cheap and easy to make that the food industry stuck it in everything, and now an ice cream flavor once synonymous with luxury has become synonymous with boring. Mint is a relatively common plant that grows all over the world, and over the centuries, lots of different cultures have used it as a flavoring agent in food and medicine. The Europeans would sometimes add mint to their South American drinking chocolate to mask the bitter taste, and this pairing has been common ever since. For practically as long as chocolate has been in America, there have been mint chocolate flavored candies and cookies and things. The Baskin Robbins people like to take credit for inventing mint chocolate ice cream as one of their original flavors back in 1953, but it seems very likely that this was a flavor that had occurred to a lot of other people before then. You could even imagine the early European aristocrats mixing cocoa and mint in their primitive ice creams back in the day, just because it was not that unusual of a flavor combo. More unusual would be the chocolate chocolate chip part, which brings us to Chocolate chip cookies were invented in the 1930s by a woman named Ruth Wakefield, who was a chef and co-owner of an Eastern Massachusetts restaurant known as the Toll House Inn. One day, Mrs. Wakefield got the bright idea to chop up a bar of chocolate and put the chunks in some plain vanilla cookie dough, and everybody grew to love these newfangled chocolate chip cookies. And no one loved them more than the Nestle Confectionery Corporation, who, sensing an opportunity to move more chocolate, bought Mrs. Wakefield's cookie recipe and started selling bags of pre-made chocolate chips with instructions on how to make your very own Toll House Inn cookies on the back. Americans started mixing in chocolate chips with their ice cream right away, but it wasn't until 1986 that a company decided to sell ice cream infused with gobs of chocolate chip cookie dough. That company was Ben & Jerry's, the pride of Burlington, Vermont. Americans have been eating cookies since the colonial times, thanks to the British, who of course have their whole rich culture of biscuits and tea. The Industrial Revolution saw cookie making shift from bakeries to factories, with a savvy Gilded Age tycoon named A.W. Green soon dominating American industrial cookie production with his National Biscuit Corporation, or Nabisco. In 1908, one of Green's competitors created an exciting new cookie called the Hydrox, with vanilla cream between two chocolate biscuits. And Green, being the savvy businessman that he was, proceeded to immediately sell his own knockoff version called the Oreo and drive Hydrox into the ground. Americans went nuts for Oreos, the cookie that could be eaten a thousand different ways. One popular approach was to crunch them up and sprinkle them on vanilla ice cream. Within the American ice cream industry, there is a fair bit of argument over who first came up with the idea of selling ice cream with the Oreo bits already mixed in, but it seems to have happened 
sometime in the 1970s. It would have made sense to just call the flavor Oreo, but of course Oreo is a registered trademark, so they couldn't do that, which is where the generic name of cookies and cream comes from. I talked a bit about the history of strawberries in my candy video, but they are basically a native North American fruit that didn't really obtain mainstream success until pioneering horticulturalists in the mid 19th century learned to breed them into the big juicy things we know today. America went through a bit of a fruit craze in the later years of the 1800s that saw a rising demand for fruit flavored everything and strawberry flavored ice cream, along with fruit flavored ice creams that are maybe a little bit less popular today, like lemon or orange were one byproduct of that. And by the way, in case you were wondering about the American tradition of combining chocolate, vanilla and strawberry strawberry ice cream together and calling it Neapolitan. This has also been done since the late 1800s. It seems to be an early example of Italian Americans trying to market what was very obviously a distinctly American flavor designed for American tastes as if it was some exotic old world treat from Italia. Pecans are another plant that is indigenous to North America, but for some reason, unlike strawberries, they have never really caught on with the rest of the world. According to this book about the history of pecans, early European settlers tended to dismiss pecans as being basically the same as walnuts, which they already had in Europe, so who cares? To this day, America produces over 80% of the world's pecans, and they're mostly just eaten by Americans. Easy to store and ship, they have long been one of America's favorite snacks, and unlike strawberries, they didn't have to be bioengineered up the wazoo to be palatable either. Americans have been sticking them in cakes and cookies and pies since forever, so it is no great shock that they wound up in our ice cream too. So there you have it, the story behind America's seven favorite ice cream flavors, at least as of now, list subject to change. Now in this week's video, we've spent a lot of time saluting the history of American innovation and entrepreneurship, but do you want to know a way that you can support modern day American entrepreneurs? By checking out this video's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is an online shopping experience where you can buy all sorts of really cool, high quality goods, 90% of which come from small businesses, most of which are located in the good old USA. We are talking stuff like handmade sunglasses from California, barbecue spices from Michigan, and fancy soaps from a Rhode Island apothecary that has been in America longer than chocolate. But today I want to tell you about their box service, wherein you can get a special curated shipment of bespoke goodies every month if you so choose. It's not really like other subscription services though, since they only make monthly recommendations and you decide if you want to buy it or swap it for something else or just get nothing at all and pay nothing. What they recommend is based on a survey that you do about your interests and let me show you some of the stuff they sent me based on mine. This here is a very handsome overnight bag that I actually recently used on a weekend trip I took the other day to Lethbridge, Alberta. So that was very appropriate for my jet setter lifestyle. And in the other box, I got this lovely uh, knife. A high quality knife is something that I have been wanting for a long while to, you know, open my parcels and things. And this one is made by the same French company that Picasso used, so it's got that going for it. And then I also got this miniature fountain pen and notebook, which is also good for me because I am super addicted to nice notebooks. You can see I even used this one to make some notes for the video. See, I've also got some ice cream on it, which is less than ideal. Anyway, viewers of this channel can get 20% off their first box by clicking on the link in the thing below and using the promo code JJ20. Should be easy to remember, eh? Or just visit bespokepost.com slash JJ20. Bespoke Post, themed boxes for people who give a damn. So. I am really riding high on these American cultural canon videos these days. I like making them, you guys seem to like watching them. What iconic realm of American life should I explore next? Let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.